Righty, well, so I've been asked uh, to speak today about endoanal alternatives uh, in the treatment of rectal cancer. And really, what I'm going to be speaking about is the future, um, the near future and the far future, and perhaps where the, those lines intersect with today. So endoanal application for rectal cancer, TEM and beyond. This is a uh, watercolor of Philadelphia, where I'm from, from uh, Dr. Gerald Marks, Sage's founder. This is where I work at uh, Lankanel, right outside the city limits. Here are my speaker disclosures. I'll talk to whoever wants to talk to me. And so talking about minimally invasive approaches to the rectum, uh, we've heard some beautiful talks. And uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about is there a role for an endoanal approach. Now, this is more than transanal. Uh, and if we take a step back a little bit in time, 2003, we heard about this crazy notion of notes, uh, poking a hole in the stomach to take out the appendix. And uh, we thought, hey, does that make much sense? Well, if you think about notes, uh, really a natural orifice operation uh, can't be spoken about it, particularly in the colorectal world without talking about uh, our dear friend Gerhard Boos, who unfortunately has uh, recently passed away. And his, his invention in 1983, think about that for a second, of transanal endoscopic microsurgery and the ability to operate endoluminally. Clearly this gave and gives the surgeon a better reach and improved visualization to approach lesions all throughout the rectum. And so the question becomes, uh, is that applicable for rectal cancer? And so this is uh, just showing a sizable uh, rectal cancer that's been uh, regressed remarkably under uh, chemo radiation. You can see here as we're looking at things, we've entered trans endo anally, transluminally, into the same plane as we saw demonstrated coming from the other side in a laparoscopic fashion. A sizable portion of tumor can be taken out. And as you look at this, you can see the, the uh, puborectalis and the entirety of the mesorectum excised in this patient and the ability endoluminally to sew things back together, put things back together in a uh, curative fashion. So I didn't come by this uh, as any great seer. This is just what was done in my unit in uh, training. Doctors Gerald Marks, Muhammad Mahoon, and Jefferson had first done this in 1984 using local excision after preoperative radiation to treat select cancers. This has been done around the world. Emmanuel Lazoki probably has the other, uh, has a the, the largest here has done trials. This is one comparing T2 cancers uh, operating on laparoscopically versus uh, TEM, 35 patients in both arms, and showing no difference in local recurrence rates, local recurrence rates uh, of about 6%, which is what uh, mirrors our data uh, in looking at the T2 cancers, 6.9% uh, local recurrence rate as well. Um, in looking at doing this over a 20-year experience, uh, what we've shown, and uh, as the time has gone on, we've used more TEM. We've shown, while there's been a higher incidence of local failure, 12%, in keeping with many of the series for radical surgery, but when we look at this by procedure, it's down to 4% for TEM and an endoluminal approach. And this is with a follow-up of over five years. So, you know, the logic, really of an endoanal approach for colorectal surgery when you're talking about making a defect in the target organ and an entry into the peritoneal cavity uh, is quite different, in my opinion, than the, the logic of uh, notes for other things like a gallbladder or, a, um, or taking out an appendix. We do have the ability to get in the abdominal cavity. And I'm just going to share with you a little bit of this is what I'm talking about where I think what we're doing today might intersect with uh, where we're going to be tomorrow. This comes from a large experience both in uh, laparoscopic minimally invasive approaches and rectal cancer and really this is 
some very, uh, this is a progress that we've been making and I'm offering to you really my thoughts more than where I think we are today. The challenges for any local therapy have to do with adequate lymphadenectomy and uh, staging up front. But if we're able to do something endoanally and actually do a mesorectal excision, it might be something different. So, you know, sometimes necessity is the mother of invention. And so this is actually a short video clip of a uh, very long, trust me, a very long and difficult day <laughs> where we started uh, laparoscopically ran into troubles advancing, and then rather than fully converting, went transanally, made an incision at the dentate line, uh, oversewed the rectum, and now what we're doing is looking uh, with the TEM scope, we're in that same plane outside of the mesorectum, coming in endoanally. So this is the look, uh, now this is a look laparoscopically. To the right and to the left, this is uh, me operating uh, through the anus and connecting. Um, and, you know, this was a challenging problem that we were able to surmount in this fashion, but it gets one to start scratching their head as to say, hey, is this uh, doable from below? This was, that was just connecting it, extracting things. And then this is an unusual view. This is what the TEM looks like coming through the anus. <laughs> you can understand why you have limited uh, mobility uh, using the TEM equipment in the upper part, and then this, this was just uh, delivering this out from below. And you can see this is a very clean dissection, but uh, this is more done from above than from below, but it was kind of a marriage of the two. So, you know, it is uh, by keeping an open mind and being um, challenging of what the dictums are <coughs> and what tools you have in your tool basket, I will say, to ask the question of, hey, can we go to the other side? Um, thankfully, it's not a ton of time that I've been uh, pushed through to the peritoneum uh, transanally, but we've done it uh, several, <coughs> over uh, two dozen times comfortably. We know we can do this. And so when I was approached by a, uh, now this is, uh, this is a benign procedure. This is a benign disease. This is a woman who's a uh, morbidly obese woman with multiple, multiple abdominal operations who'd had a uh, total abdominal colectomy and endoleosomy and then developed a uh, problematic uh, fistula with her remnant uh, rectum. I didn't feel comfortable doing everything to do the proctectomy entirely transanally without laparoscopic guidance to make sure I wasn't going to poke into a, a loop of small bowel, but what we did in this case was start the proctectomy transanally, as I said, in sizing at the dentate line, which we showed. And then we got started using the TEM equipment. You can see off to the right uh, is the was the view. You can see the levator sling. And then this is the uh, rectum, the finger, and the vagina. I had trouble because of the mobility, the length of the TEM equipment. So we put in a uh, sills port, a single port. And um, this allowed a little bit more mobility around uh, 360 degrees, and this is showing doing the uh, proctectomy. You can see the uneven insufflation. You can see the levators pinching in, and here we are coming through anteriorly into the uh, pelvic sac. I'm sorry, into the uh, pouch of Douglas. And uh, in this case, you can see the inset there is where we're uh, connecting through the pouch of Douglas from below, so that we're in a position to then complete things all the way around. You know, again, as we're looking at this, this is kind of, uh, we're talking about rectal cancer. I'm not saying that this is where we are today, but I'm offering this as a possibility in terms of a way, a, a direction for us to get to uh, tomorrow. And this is just taking a look into the abdominal cavity uh, through there and the specimen uh, coming out. And, so really this was an entire proctectomy done uh, endoanally. We've since moved on to do some of these without uh, laparoscopic uh, guidance from above. And I think that uh, there are some challenges and there's certainly things to be worked out in this regard. But it's an interesting opportunity, uh, I think, as we move forward. And I think it's worthwhile for people to be focused on this as an opportunity to do something more than what we're doing today in a, uh, 
in a standard laparoscopic fashion. So in conclusion, as uh, we move towards the future, I think there is going to be a role for an uh, endoluminal approach. What ultimately lies on the other side and how we're going to approach it uh, remains to be defined. There are certainly going to be challenges from a cancer standpoint, first and foremost. And I think also from a technical standpoint, they're going to need to be worked out and ultimately, uh, because this will definitely be uh, swimming with the sharks. So I think uh, it is more a question mark as to what's going to happen in the future. I think that remains to be determined, but I think there are going to be people in the room here who are going to be help, uh, able to add to that body of knowledge. And so I wanted to put that forward to you uh, in terms of approaching rectal cancer in minimally invasive fashion. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent talk, John, and thanks for 